Enoch, a biblical enigma, drifts through ancient scrolls like a shadowy figure. His story, shrouded in mystery, piques our curiosity and invites speculation. Who was this elusive character descending from Cain? Legends suggest he journeyed beyond earthly bounds, traversing celestial realms without fear. Was he a celestial messenger or simply an ancient explorer with an overactive imagination? The enigmatic aura surrounding Enoch beckons us to uncover the truth hidden within the whispers of time, leaving us to wonder and ponder the secrets he carried to his celestial resting place. It's time we delve into the origins of Enoch and the intriguing Enochian tradition. Building upon our previous exploration of Adam and Eve and Cain's origins and various other myths, we now take a dive into the rich picture of Enoch's story. Filled with a plethora of mystical elements such as magical knowledge, demons, giants, fallen angels, and celestial visitations. But before we try to unravel the mysterious Enoch, we need to recap where we are in the mythical beginnings of mankind told from the biblical narrative. We started with the obvious primordial myth of Adam and Eve, who have clear narrative connections to ancient Mesopotamia in the Adapa, Atrahasis epic, and epic of Gilgamesh. We followed Adam's seed to his sons Cain and Abel, who represent the first murder. Cain most likely represents farmers and agriculture, while Abel represents the shepherds, who are nomadic. Hint, hint, that's why he's the good guy. Several Mesopotamian and Egyptian stories have common themes in their agricultural settings, and as we turn the page to Enoch, I need you to understand what we're gazing at. As biblical scholar Ronald Hindle, Assyriologist Joshua Bowen, and several other experts in their respected fields have recognized that the Genesis authors are reversing the theme of the massive Babylonian kingdom's mythology, with the ziggurat as the pinnacle of civilization. Several scholars, including Dr. Joshua Bowen, have written clear as day how Genesis has intertextuality with the much earlier myths of Mesopotamia. You know, the human imagination is amazing, as can be seen in fictional movies and literature, which includes these myths. As far back as written history, humans have written myths trying to explain how we got here, how the world and everything seen exists, and why they are that way. Why snakes crawl on their bellies or why women have pain in childbirth. Why humans are mortal and die in due time. While these fundamental questions get answered differently by various ancient creation mythologies, the biblical one is late on history's radar in retelling its creation story and great flood. Enoch sits in this strange transition between the first man and woman and the destruction of humans by God and his divine counsel. Yep, you heard that right. There are several other gods with the biblical God. I mean, the biblical narrative expresses this all throughout the Bible. Mesopotamia thinks it's good for humanity to have the knowledge of the gods, which includes divination, magic, agriculture, witchcraft, and other secret knowledge. The biblical authors want to condemn this insight, as it only belongs to God or the gods and not humans. Mesopotamia says the city is good, and the Bible says that the city is bad. One good, one bad. Enoch picks up on this tradition and hammers the hell out of it. Our goal today will be to inform you of the origins of Enoch, which stretch back to the oldest known god in written history from Mesopotamia. It's strange that entire books were dedicated to this guy because 
he gets the smallest introduction in a long line of others smack dab in a genealogical list which looks awfully similar to the Sumerian king's list. Just so you know, our goal on MythVision is to bring you the best and legit scholarship from experts in their respected field, and one such fascinating scholar who sees obvious connections between Enoch and these far, far earlier Mesopotamian myths is Dr. or Professor Seth Sanders, who wrote the wonderful book, From Adapa to Enoch, Scribal Culture and Religious Vision in Judea and Babylonia. Let's take a moment to focus on a significant ancient myth that influenced the biblical authors as well as the Enochian tradition, the myth of Adapa. Adapa was one of the most popular literary figures in ancient Mesopotamia. I mean, he was so popular that some scribes would even claim to be him. They claimed to be this semi-human, super-powered sage who went to heaven, met the gods, and have uttered some of the most important works of religious literature. Later, down the road, we see several scribes in the Jewish history of Aramaic and Hebrew literature who claim to identify with these ancient heavenly revealer figures. Enoch is one such heavenly revealer figure. But oftentimes, it is also overlooked that Moses is as well. Moses ascends to the top of a mountain. Sometimes it's Sinai and sometimes it's Horeb. But he goes to the throne of God in the heavens where the mountains meet the clouds, and meets with God, then comes back down to humanity to reveal the divine revelations to mankind. This is exactly what Enoch is doing. The Dead Sea Scrolls scribes were often claiming to be enthroned in heaven. Reminds me of the Ephesians passage of being seated in heavenly places. Keep in mind, the first evidence of what people were reading as scripture is from the Dead Sea literature. And while our Bibles today exclude Enoch from being scripture apart from the Ethiopic tradition, at the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as they were being written, it was the most popular kinds of stories, even more popular than several of the books Jews and Christians revere today. I repeat, Enoch was extremely popular and was read far more than most of the biblical books we have in our Bibles today, which Christians and Jews call scripture. In fact, there may be some ancient drama here for your inquisitive minds. Professor Gabriel Baccaccini has postulated that two different Torahs were floating around in various Jewish communities. Our Torah that we have in our Bibles today that centralizes Moses was one, and the other priestly group had a Torah with Enoch as their centralized figure and heavenly revealer. Both groups seemed to wrestle over the temple in Jerusalem. Even Dead Sea Scroll scholar expert Kip Davis agrees with many a Boccaccini's observations. The idea that people can go between heaven and earth to bring back wisdom literally spans back into Sumer, which is the oldest known writing in the world. These sages, which traverse back and forth, are trying to access the larger order of the universe. They seem to be people who play a shamanic role with mystical revelations explaining the divine revealed secrets of the universe. It is often propagandistic for running empires and kings, and I bet you it was helpful to say their knowledge comes from heaven as authoritative. That kind of power and inequality of having this insight would put these sages in a safe place against other humans, 
as we see the sheep of any religion sees their cultic leaders as over them. Ancient kings would have these people on their payroll, and ancients would make similar criticisms we do today against the religious who use their roles to get money from the devotees, whether it's church or a seer telling you your future. They would say these ancient Mesopotamian sages dressed up in fish costumes and sucked the money from others' pockets. Here's a fun fact about these ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian stories is that they are extremely well documented and preserved. The documentation is often preserved on clay tablets and we have several original copies of many things, unlike the Bible, where parchment, papyri, and other ways of documenting have been lost in the sands of history. So we have to use several other tools to try guessing on reconstructing the data. In ancient Mesopotamia, we have two thorough ascent to heaven myths. Though there are others, one is the myth of Etana and the other of Adapa. Here's a brief summary of the myth of Etana. Once upon a time, in the realm of ancient Sumeria, there lived a king named Etana, a ruler with ambitions as lofty as the heavens themselves. In a bid to secure an heir, he embarked in a remarkable quest, soaring through the celestial expanse on the mighty wings of an eagle. His destination? The divine realm, where he sought the fabled plant of birth from the gods, hoping it would grant him the gift of fatherhood since he is described as infertile. In the detailed form of the legend, there is a tree with the eagle's nest at the top and a serpent at the base. Both the serpent and eagle have promised Utu, the sun god, to behave well toward one another, and they share food with their children. But one day, the eagle eats the serpent's children. The serpent comes back and cries. Utu tells the serpent to hide inside the stomach of a dead bull. The eagle goes down to eat the bull. The serpent captures the eagle and throws him into a pit to die of hunger and thirst. Utu sends a man, Etana, to help the eagle. Etana saves the eagle, but he also asks the bird to find the plant of birth in order to become father of a son. The eagle takes Etana up to the heaven of the god, Anu, the oldest god in written history. But Etana becomes afraid in the air and goes back to the ground. He makes another attempt and finds the plant of birth, enabling him to have Balai. Etana's royal pedigree was no mere fabrication, or so they would want you to believe for he held the prestigious title of the first king of Kish. As chronicled in the esteemed Sumerian king list, this king's list was a very early myth genealogical origin story in Mesopotamia. In the annals of history, he was held as he who stabilized the lands, a regal figurehead tasked with bringing order to the chaotic world birthed by the gods. With such a distinguished reputation, it's no wonder he was cast as the leading protagonist in this captivating myth, a paragon of kingly virtue who united the lands of his time. He is most likely a mythological king who gets his own myth in the old Babylonian period, circa 1894 BC, to 1595 BC. His myth claims that he is the first real king, even though several kings of the Sumerian kings list are mentioned as earlier genealogical kings of Etana. However, as many scholars have noted, the names of these earlier kings mentioned on this list have names which indicate chaos or symbolize the disorder of the primordial period, indicating they're probably fabricated metaphors as names.
The story's essence is one of unwavering trust in the divine, a message whispered across the ages. And who better to embody this profound wisdom than the renowned ruler himself, Atena, with his regal splendor and resolute character, became the ideal vessel to convey the lesson of putting faith in the gods, handpicked by this mysterious author of the myth. As evidence of its ancient origins, intricate cylinder seals have been discovered, showcasing the brave Etna perched atop his feathered steed during the reign of Sargon of Akkad. These remarkable artifacts serve as portals to the bygone era, testaments to the enduring power of myth and the timeless allure of Etna's soaring exploits. Thus, the myth of Etna weaves a tale that transcends time, whisking us away to a realm where kings commune with eagles and divine plants hold the promise of lineage. It implores us to embrace the celestial unknown and trust in powers beyond our mortal grasp. For even in the realm of myth and legend, the echoes of wisdom still resonate, reminding us to take flight on the wings of faith, as many of the faithful would suggest. My recommendation is to be highly skeptical and consider these stories, cherry-picking the good, throwing out the bad. This myth of Etna is the only Mesopotamian written myth that we have documented before writing, with several seals with a guy going to heaven on an eagle's back. Etna was called a shepherd, similar to what you find with King David and Jesus, because a shepherd looks after his flock and was a metaphor of kingship even before writing. In the seals of Etna, it is literally a shepherd on the seal. By the first millennium, Etna has fallen out of popularity and is considered an underworld ruler or judge of the dead. The myth of Adapa is also written down in a very early period during the old Babylonian times. However, contrasting Adapa to Etana, Adapa gains steam and grows in popularity over the millennia. Most of the great Neo-Assyrian kings like Sargon II, who destroyed Israel, is equated with Adapa. In the realm of Mesopotamian mythology, a captivating story unfolds, starring none other than the mysterious Adapa. Unbeknownst to him, this legendary figure inadvertently spurned the enticing offer of everlasting life, referred to as Adapa and the South Wind. This mesmerizing account is pieced together from fragmented tablets discovered at Tel El Amarna in ancient Egypt during the 14th century BC, as well as from artifacts unearthed in the illustrious library of Ashurbanipal in Assyria during the 7th century BC. Delving further into antiquity, the oldest records of this intriguing character stem from Tel Hadad tablets inscribed in the sacred language of Sumerian, helling from the 19th to the 16th century BC. Adapa's prominence within the realm of Mesopotamian faith cannot be understated. Uttering his name became a potent invocation in the mystical realm of exorcism rituals, a conduit to channel supernatural forces. Furthermore, he assumed the role of a powerful ruler, his name invoked, to elicit favorable comparisons and emulate his wisdom. Among the scholarly circles, there exists a conflation between Adapa and the Apkalu, renowned as Uana. Here is Adapa's myth. After the flood, although the kingship was in Kish, humanity was without guidance and had no direction. 
and this led to the rise of Adapa. Adapa was a mortal man, extremely pious, faithful servant and sage or priest of the Temple of Inki. Or, in Babylon, this god was called Ea, who is the lord of magic and secret knowledge in the city of Eridu. Inki, sometimes considered his father, had given Adapa the gift of great wisdom, but not eternal life. While carrying out his duties being a faithful servant, he was fishing at the river Tigris to catch fish to offer as an offering to his god Inki. The sea became rough by the strong south wind and his boat was capsized. He may have drowned from this, but angry, Adapa ascends out of the water and utters a magic spell which broke the wings of the south wind, preventing it from blowing for seven days. Humans are not supposed to be able to do this, and the south wind was absolutely necessary for farming in this part of the world. So the world has come to a pause because of Adapa. The oldest known writing god in the world, the god Anu, freaks out wondering who messed up the natural order of the world. So he called Adapa to account for his action by coming up to heaven. But Inki warns him by instructing Adapa that they're going to try tricking you in heaven by giving you deadly food and water, probably poisonous. When offered garments and oil, he should put the clothes on and anoint himself, but don't eat. Sounds kind of familiar, right? The Garden of Eden story? So Adapa goes to heaven and is questioned, why did you do this? Adapa said, the wind attacked me. Anu laughed and said, You humans are funny with your magic that give you divine powers. Anu instructs him to put on the oil and garments. So Adapa puts on the oil and garments as he recalls his master Inki said this was okay to do. Adapa is then offered the food of life and water of life, but will not eat or drink because he remembers the instructions of his god Inki. Anu, who asks, why he will not eat or drink. Adapa replies that Inki told him not to. Anu laughs at Inki's actions and passes judgment on Adapa by asking rhetorically, what ill has Adapa brought on mankind? He adds that men will suffer disease as a consequence, which might explain an origin myth that we ask again in our stories. Why do people get diseases? Adapa is then sent back down to Earth. This is the origin story of his supernatural power of being able to do divine things and do mortal things. Incantations is one of the things Adapa brings to mankind from his visitation to heaven. Assyriologist and Hebrew Bible scholar Joshua Bowen has noted that Inki is trying to trick his devoted student and servant Adapa into not eating from the food and water of immortality because he wants Adapa to bring the knowledge of the gods to mankind. If he would have eaten the food and water of life, he would have remained completely separated from mankind and the secret knowledge would have remained contained only in heaven with the gods. Inki flat out just lied, but he did so to help humanity out. It reminds me of when Yahweh lied to Adam and Eve to keep them from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both deities lie to the humans, but for the opposite reasons. Yahweh wants to keep mankind in a state of innocence and without the understanding of the gods. In the intricate medley of ancient civilizations, scribal wisdom, magical practices, and ritual mythology played a significant role in the service of kings, such as those reigning over the mighty empires of Assyria and Babylon. What captivates the mind when considering the era leading up to Enoch is the remarkable spread of this literature. 
even in the absence of its original patrons. From the dethroning of the King of Babylon to the rise of Persia and the advent of Alexander the Great's Hellenistic era, the temples stood tall and the priesthoods flourished, their influence expanding in certain regions. In the absence of a central monarch, the scribes themselves sometimes assumed the central role, becoming the custodians of knowledge and authority. As the late Jonathan Z. Smith astutely observed, the emergence of apocalypticism seemed intricately tied to the decline of a native kingship. A noteworthy artifact, the king list from Uruk, catalogs the names of earthly kings alongside their esteemed sages. These sages were not only repositories of secret knowledge, but also wielders of healing arts and the power to exercise demons. Among these malevolent entities, one finds the infamous Lamashtu, a demon known for abducting and causing harm to newborns in ancient Mesopotamia. Intriguingly, this figure serves as the ancestral precursor to Lilith, a prominent character in Jewish lore, often portrayed as Adam's supposed first wife. In a society steeped in misogyny, the moral of this cautionary tale echoes, refrain from engaging in contentious arguments with your husband, particularly when the dispute revolves around matters of intimacy. I trust you grasp the underlying message. In the midst of this rich jumble, one figure emerges as a hero in the face of Lamashtu's malevolence, Adapa. Revered in their tradition, Adapa possessed the rare ability to ward off the menacing demon, illustrated in a remarkable plaque during the 9th and 7th centuries BC. We witness the sage Adapa adorned in an attire reminiscent of a fish, valiantly protecting patients or expectant mothers from the demon's harm. Delving into the complex depths of ancient Mesopotamian lore unveils a world where scribes rose to prominence, demonic forces loomed, and heroes arose to confront them. It is a testament to the intricacies of historical narratives where the interplay of power, mythology, and cultural belief shaped the collective consciousness of civilizations. But still luring in the air is the intriguing question at hand revolves around the interactions between Judean scribes and Mesopotamian traditions, particularly considering the striking resemblances between the narratives of Adapa and Enoch. Both figures emerge as a celestial messengers hailing from primordial times, and both become personified by scribes. Despite the lack of extensive verbal overlap between the two, scholars have noted profound structural parallels prompting further exploration into the potential connection between Enoch and the earlier Adapa myth. It is noteworthy that both Mesopotamian and Judean societies underwent similar transformations, including the loss of native kingship, and the conquest by the Persians and Alexander the Great. In both contexts, scribal cultures experienced comparable changes. Professor Jonathan Ben Dove has drawn attention to the remarkable similarity between the astronomical knowledge present in Enoch and the astronomical knowledge associated with the Dapa in Mesopotamian literature. These conceptual affinities, though distinct, beg the question of how they can be connected. During the late Persian period, the same individuals held positions of power in both institutions, namely those who controlled the temples and education. In Babylon, education centered around Aramaic parchment writing scribes, who gained prominence due to the native Babylonian families' revolt against the Persian rulers. Consequently, New scribes assumed control of Babylonian temples towards the end of the Persian period. At this juncture, 
Babylonian scholarship thrived, with scribes trained in standardized Aramaic. Simultaneously, these scribes became the teachers of Hebrew scribes, instructing them in the art of writing. Thus, it becomes evident that Hebrew scribes during the Hellenistic period adopted an Aramaic script as evident in their written works. The scholarly dominance of Aramaic practitioners extended throughout the Persian and Hellenistic empires, leaving a significant imprint on the intellectual landscape. This is corroborated by the presence of Aramaic Levi documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which employ a base 60 mathematical system rooted in Sumerian tradition, as well as Babylonian style astronomy. Shared training among scholars naturally engenders shared literary ideas, further blurring the boundaries between distinct cultural and textual traditions. In a nutshell, these scribes would have known the Babylonian myths that root back to ancient Sumer and could easily have conveyed this knowledge to the Hebrew and Aramaic scribes. Interestingly, the Adapa myth from Mesopotamia and the concept of the Apkalu played a significant role in influencing the authors of the Enochian literature. The concept of the Apkalu, known as the Seven Sages, in Mesopotamian mythology played a formative role in shaping the imagery and ideas within the Enochian literature. It's not a coincidence that Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam, especially with the Apkalu being seven sages. The number seven holds symbolic importance in ancient cultures, often representing completeness, perfection, and divine order. The association of both the Apkalu and Enoch with the number seven suggests their elevated status and their connection to divine wisdom. The Apkalu were considered semi-divine beings who were believed to possess extraordinary knowledge and skills that they imparted to humanity. They were depicted as half-human, half-fish or bird, and were revered as ancient sages and benefactors of civilization. In the Enochian literature, we see echoes of the Apkalu in the figure of Enoch himself, and the heavenly beings with whom he interacts. Enoch is portrayed as a sage and revealer of divine secrets, much like the Apkalu. The imagery of hybrid beings combining human and celestial features finds parallels in the descriptions of angelic beings encountered by Enoch during his celestial journeys. But to truly grasp the origins and influences behind the Enochian stories, as well as the broader biblical creation and flood accounts, it is essential to delve into a significant historical discovery. The credit for the initial scholarly translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh rests with George Smith, a British Assyriologist who in the late 19th century worked as a self-taught expert at the British Museum. In 1872, Smith unveiled his groundbreaking translation of the Flood Tablet, an excerpt from the Epic of Gilgamesh detailing a cataclysmic deluge and the hero's survival. This momentous revelation reverberated throughout the academic community, triggering a heated discourse on its striking resemblances to the biblical flood narrative. The unearthing of the Epic of Gilgamesh, with its parallels to the account of Noah's Ark in the Bible, sent shockwaves through the intellectual realm, igniting profound contemplation. The shared elements between the two stories, such as a hero constructing an ark to survive a global flood and bringing along animals, raised intriguing inquiries about the genesis and universality of the biblical story. For many scholars of the time, 
This discovery posed a formidable challenge to long-held beliefs regarding the exceptionalism and divine inspiration of the Bible. The striking correspondences indicated that the biblical flood account was not an isolated occurrence, but rather part of a broader cultural and literary tradition prevalent in the ancient Near East. This realization prompted a reevaluation of the Bible's status as an exclusive and infallible religious text. The impact of unearthing the Epic of Gilgamesh on biblical scholarship cannot be overstated. It catalyzed further investigations into comparative mythology, ancient Near Eastern literature, and the intricate interplay between religious concepts and cultural exchange. This watershed moment ushered in a new era of biblical studies demanding a more nuanced understanding of its historical and cultural context and fostering a deeper appreciation for the intricate picture of ancient religious and mythological traditions. This discovery propelled comparative studies to new heights and enriched our comprehension of the interconnectedness and shared human experiences that underlie ancient religious traditions. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the protagonist obtains the plant of life, but loses it to a snake. Similarly, Enoch, in his tradition, attains immortality, never experiencing death, and survives the flood, much like Utnapishtim. While the direct comparison between Gilgamesh and Enoch may not be as explicit as with Adapa, the overarching theme persists. A human figure who endures the deluge, such as Utnapishtim, acquires immortality but is distanced from humanity while Gilgamesh, a restless wanderer, embarks on a quest following the death of his dear friend Enkidu, driven by his fear of mortality. Alas, Gilgamesh fails to complete his trials and returns home empty-handed. Multiple poems recount Gilgamesh's story, each with its own unique details, yet the underlying essence remains. Interestingly, scholars widely agree that the Epic of Gilgamesh exerted significant influence on the Iliad and the Odyssey, two epic poems composed in ancient Greek during the 8th century BC, a fascinating tidbit of information to ponder. Enter the world of Enochian literature, a treasure trove of texts that expand upon the biblical narrative and offer a tantalizing glimpse into a realm teeming with angels, cosmic journeys, and divine revelations. In this rich jumble of apocryphal writings, Enoch becomes an ambassador between humans and the heavenly realms, rubbing shoulders with angelic beings and attaining the title of Scribe of the Angels. The Enochian literature, comprising works such as 1st Enoch, 2nd Enoch, and 3rd Enoch, presents Enoch as a seer, a prophet, and a revealer of hidden knowledge. In these texts, he is bestowed with the divine visions, uncovering secrets about creation, the workings of the universe, and even the esoteric arts of astrology and magic. Enoch ascends through the heavenly spheres, navigating a celestial landscape that rivals the most elaborate science fiction tales, all while conversing with celestial luminaries and receiving cosmic revelations. In this alternate Enochian universe, our protagonist's significance transcends that of a mere ancestor. Enoch becomes a luminary figure, a conduit for divine wisdom and a herald of eschatological events. He walks the fine line between the human and the divine, straddling the realms of mortality and immortality. Through his writings and revelations, 
Enoch becomes a spiritual guide, offering a roadmap to understanding the mysteries of existence and the divine plan. If we're going to attempt solving the Enochian enigma, we should consider evaluating the Genesis 5 genealogy where we first see Enoch, the son of Cain, appear momentarily like the blink of an eye. Let us look at the Mesopotamian kings list and the genealogy presented in Genesis 5, as they share several similarities which have led scholars to explore possible connections between the two. There's genealogical structure, both the Mesopotamian Kings list and the genealogy in Genesis 5 follow a similar structure of listing multiple generations in a linear fashion. They present a series of individuals, often with long lifespans, who are said to have ruled or lived for extended periods. Longevity. Both the Kings list and Genesis 5 feature individuals with remarkably long lifespans. In the Kings list, the early rulers are recorded as living for hundreds of thousands of years, while the genealogy in Genesis 5 depicts individuals living for several hundred years. These exceptionally long lifespans are not commonly found in other historical or mythological accounts. Their sequential descendants, both lineages in the Kings list and Genesis 5, provide a direct line of descendants. Each individual is listed as the son of the preceding one, creating a clear lineage from one generation to the next. And then there's divine or semi-divine connection. In both accounts, there is a connection to the divine or semi-divine realm. The king's list includes rulers who are descended as having been in direct communication with gods or even having divine ancestry. Similarly, the genealogy in Genesis 5 emphasizes the descendant's connection to Adam, who is portrayed as having a special relationship with God. These shared characteristics have led scholars to propose that there may be a connection or shared influence between the Mesopotamian kings list and the genealogy in Genesis 5. Some scholars even suggest that the biblical account may have been influenced by or borrowed elements from the Mesopotamian tradition during the Babylonian captivity, as was noted in the previous Origins of Cain and Abel video. In passing, I want to note that there's an ancient Babylonian priest and historian named Barosis who played a significant role in providing insights into the ancient Near Eastern context and aiding our understanding of the book of Genesis. He was born in the 4th century BCE. Barosis was a scholar of Babylonian and Chaldean history and culture, and he's written several works. In his work, he discusses the Sumerian kings list, which exhibit intriguing similarities in their numerical calculations. Both genealogies employ a systematic approach that highlights the lineage and the longevity of their respective figures. The significance, though, of Enoch's 365-year lifespan within this framework is indeed striking. A solar calendar consisting of 365 days per year offers a compelling explanation for this particular duration. The numerical correspondence between Enoch's lifespan and the number of days in a solar year hints at a deliberate choice of a solar calendar system by the biblical authors. This interpretation underscores the need to consider the cultural and astronomical context of the ancient Near East, where solar calendars play a prominent role in timekeeping and agricultural cycles. I just want to highlight it from the Greek world. In Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan who defies the gods by stilling fire and giving it to humanity. This act of rebellion and the subsequent gift of fire symbolize Prometheus' role as a benefactor of humanity and a bringer of knowledge. Like the Apkalu and Inki, Prometheus is portrayed as an intermediary figure who challenges the authority of the gods and bestows wisdom upon humans. Additionally, the concept of Divine beings interacting with mortals can be seen in Greek mythology through figures such as Prometheus. 
Prometheus was a titan who stole fire from the gods, gave it to the humans, an act that defied divine authority and led to consequences for both Prometheus and humanity. This act of transgression and the sharing of forbidden knowledge parallel the actions of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. The giants in Greek mythology were a race of powerful and monstrous beings who rose up against the Olympian gods. Their conflict with the gods, known as the Giants, The giants in Greek mythology were a race of powerful and monstrous beings who rose up against the Olympian gods. Enoch has giants in it as well. And you might as well say that Gilgamesh was a massive, strong, giant-type figure, which we see giants in the Genesis 6 account with the sons of God who come down. There has to be some type of connection. While I have searched far and wide along with other Assyriologists to try and find a direct birth narrative where a god mates with a mortal woman creating giants, we don't find it. But Gilgamesh is two-thirds divine, one-third mortal or human. This figure with his strength and power unlike regular mortals, seems to imply some type of tradition that has seeped its way into all of this literature. Also, let's note the comparison between the Titans' war against the Olympians in Hellenistic mythology and the rebellion of the fallen angels or sons of God against Yahweh in the Book of Enoch highlights certain parallels in their themes and motifs, suggesting possible influences or shared cultural concepts. In Greek mythology, the Titans were a group of primordial beings or deities who ruled before the Olympian gods. According to the myth, the Titans, led by figures such as Kronos and Prometheus, waged war against the Olympian gods in an attempt to overthrow their rule. This conflict symbolizes a cosmic struggle between different generations of gods and the establishment of a new divine order. Similarly, in the Book of Enoch, an apocryphal text associated with Jewish and early Christian traditions, a group of angels known as the Watchers, or Fallen Angels, rebels against Yahweh. These angels descend to earth, interact with humans, and teach them forbidden knowledge and practices. Their rebellion against divine authority is seen as a violation of the cosmic order and leads to the corruption and downfall of humanity. The parallel between the Titans and the Rebellion of the Fallen Angels reflects a shared theme of divine conflict and the tension between different generations or factions of celestial beings. Both narratives convey the struggle for power, the challenge to establish divine authority, and the consequences that arise from such rebellion. I want to thank you for joining us on this captivating journey through the ancient world of myths. We've explored the fascinating connections between Mesopotamian, Greek, and Enochian traditions, unearthing the echoes of divine rebellion, cosmic battles, and the interplay between gods and mortals. But our exploration has only just begun. As we delve further into the realms of ancient mythology, we can't help but wonder what secrets lie within the deep mythology of Noah, the great-grandson of Enoch. How does his story intertwine with the cosmic flood and survival of humanity? Join us in the next episode as we unravel the mysteries surrounding Noah's mythos and its profound implications. We hope you've enjoyed this enlightening expedition into the rich mosaic of ancient myths. If you found this video thought-provoking and entertaining, please, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Also, it would help the algorithm gods for you to leave a comment and share your thoughts. Tell me what you liked the most from this video. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube as well to help spread the word about our channel. For those seeking an even deeper connection with our mythological explorations, consider joining our YouTube membership or Patreon, where you can gain exclusive access to bonus content behind-the-scenes insights, and become part of our ever-growing family of mythology enthusiasts. So mark your calendars and prepare for the next installment of our journey into the ancient world of myths, 
where we'll unlock the enigmatic mythology of Noah and uncover secrets that have captivated minds for centuries. Until then, stay curious, keep exploring, and let the myths guide you to new horizons. But always keep your mind skeptical.